My name is Spencer Crum. Thanks for having me at DevNexus. Really appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you. I'm wearing two microphones because we have a sort of a PA system and a, a mic for the video, which is fun. Um, and I am attempting to use the conference Wi-Fi. So if, if we end up having some struggles, uh, we can tether. I don't know. We'll figure it out. We can get that down the road. Um, I work at, at IBM, uh, the International Business Machines. Um, my Twitter handle is on the, on the board there. Uh, so my background, um, you know, coming to DevNexus is a little bit of an outside my comfort zone thing for me, personally, just because I have not ever really written Java for work. Um, most of my career is actually not in sort of what you might call, um, you know, daily production line software development. It's mostly in operations and maintenance and development on the software delivery pipeline. So that means the CI system or the PaaS or just doing general DevOps work around the infrastructure and stuff. And of course, I end up touching all the different pieces of code. Um, I have some, I, you know, I have spent so much time looking at JMX graphs in like 2014. Believe me, I've been there. But, you know, there was not a lot of code changes there. So it's a little outside my comfort zone, but I really appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you. And I think I have some good stuff to talk about. Um, I am from Minnesota, as we talked about earlier. I grew up in Portland, uh, or, or Eugene, actually. Um, Minnesota is the cold north. Um, I was really expecting more sun here in Atlanta. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but it's OK. I'm happy. Um, I play a lot of StarCraft. I play a lot of Counter-Strike. If you're into either of those things, I can talk about those for hours. Um, and then I'd say the last year or two of my career has been very much focused on containers. You know, not a unique journey at all, but um, that's that's where I'm spending a lot of my time. So, uh, out of curiosity, you know, this is a charge term and it's like 10 years old, but DevOps is a thing. Um, and everyone sort of has their own definition of DevOps, but I would say first and foremost, DevOps is not a tool base. It's not, you can't buy a tool. You can't buy a tool and call yourself DevOps. You also, I mean, people do this, but you shouldn't just create a team and call them the DevOps team and then keep everyone else sort of working in the same direction. And the idea is to share and to collaborate and to trust each other and a little bit let um, not just the workflow between teams, but let trust and authority as well. Um, the sooner that operations is brought into the conversation around what development actually needs, the better the result's going to be. And the more insight that the developers have into what the operational constraints are and realities are, um, the better software they can write as well. And it doesn't matter who you are on, on which side of the team you are, this is where it's going. What usually gets left out of this conversation until very, somewhat recently is security, and that's sort of what we're going to talk about today. Um, you know, it, you could change all the words on this for every organization, and it would basically be the same. But the idea is that we walk in these loops. Organizations and teams provide this kind of continuous delivery lifecycle. Whether you really, you know, have an exec that's screaming continuous delivery and agile from the rooftops or not, realistically, you make a plan. You go design, you build, you do some testing, you end up deploying it, and then you start over again and you iterate on that. And then inside that loop, down at the bottom in the develop section is I, I assume where most of you work. Is that accurate? I'm seeing some nods. I'm seeing some shakes, some heads. More on the operation side? Design. You're in the design side. Oh, that's awesome, because bringing designers in and not just like, that's good. <laughs> You can also lateralize it out. Um, if you look just at this develop section of the loop, the, the develop section usually ends up looking something like this, this very standard loop of develop the application, build and test the application, build some kind of image. You know, The world is a container-based world mostly these days. Um, or at least that's where people want to go and what we're going to talk about today. Then you deploy it. And then you have some facility for monitoring current status, whether that's homegrown or a collection of vendor utilities or whatever. And this, this is kind of your standard day. And I've, I've personally done most of these jobs. I assume most of you have as well. And you, you're, you're familiar with this general loop. Um, most of what I'm going to talk about today is not super Java specific. But for those who haven't seen this developer loop in the Kubernetes context, I wanted to take you through the ultimate basics of how how that works in a Kubernetes context so that you're grounded when we talk more and like deeper about Kubernetes and containers later in the talk. So um, 
my very good friend Billy Carondo wrote me a very simple Hello World Java Spring Boot application because I could not do that. Um, uh, there's some files here. Uh, the code, ooh. The code looks very similar. I, you know, on the left side we've got some, if you haven't seen this before, this is like some Spring Boot boilerplate. And then over here is whatever web framework you're familiar with, you've probably seen some kind of route like that before. It just waits for somebody to ask it a question and it says hello. If you input a string, it will echo the input string back to you. This is not, this is not rug science, right? Um, so what is the, so that's the development loop. The build loop basically happens inside uh, one of these, one of these build scripts. I mean, I oh I can make this bigger too if people need it. You know this this bottom line that ends up calling Maven with a bunch of properties. I think many people have seen that before. I'm not going to run that because we're kind of on a timeline here. But the result of that is going to be some jar file, right? And that's the application that could be whatever you know. Everybody has a different pipeline of what you do with the jar file, but the pipeline we're talking about today is gonna be adding it to a Docker image, a container, that we're then gonna deploy on the cloud. So the Docker file is, is as simple as can be, right? It's, um, there's some complexity hidden in here, which is that we're taking uh, a pre-built image and then doing one change to it and then shipping it, which means you really don't know what the status is or what's next, but it's also very illustrative and this is 100% how I recommend you use Docker um, today and I, I recommend that to everybody who's working with Docker. Um, the point is here we're gonna copy in the jar file and then we're gonna specify what command to run to, to run the application. Um, then the next layer on top of that is we're actually gonna deploy the application and that's where things get a little this is why I wanted to center you all because showing, jumping directly into this Kubernetes YAML file is not useful to anyone if you're not, you know, uh, it's not that, that's maybe not the right thing to say, but um, either you're very familiar with Kubernetes and you can interpret this YAML or you're not, in which case this is intimidating and weird, so it's not that useful to go through is what I'm trying to say. But the point is, this is the YAML file that we're gonna use with Kubernetes and the key line, most of that is boilerplate except for the thing where we specify what image to use. Then what we can do is, you know, sort of verify that we're connected to a Kubernetes cluster. Um, the fact that we can see our three worker nodes indicates that we have an application, authentication is working. We can come through and do a kubectl apply-f deployment. It's gonna go in there and create some things. Uh, we can see the deployment right there. We can see the service. We can kubectl get the pods themselves, which are sort of a proxy for the, uh, a very low level way to talk to the container. Um, we can, uh, we can log, we can get the logs on a single container, uh, but I have to paste. And you can see uh, sort of our spring application, pretty standard. And then what we can do is do a kubectl uh, port, or, oh. And this this is magic. Don't worry. This is not important. It's just it's just illustrative. Um, now we've connected to the cluster. And we've we've got something coming out the other side. We, we're able to use the application. That is the loop that we just talked about. The monitor phase, all we've really done from a monitor phase is is read those logs one time, but that's okay. You know, it 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 isn't uh, Um, does anyone know the URL escape for a new line? Is it like A0? Nope, <laughs> doesn't matter. The point is we've, got, we've made a little application, we walked it from the development into the, the build phase, like we could run tests against those jars. Then we built our Docker image, which is then a very portable, immutable structure that we can ship around. Then we handed that to the platform, which in this case is Kubernetes, and now it's running and we can poke it, right? That's, that hopefully, regardless of where your job is, gives you a pipeline of, and some, 
some side, signposts and compasses to let you know where you are as we start talking about the rest of the stuff today. Yeah. So that's the developer loop. What I want to talk about today, and security is a fraught topic. Everybody has opinions on security. I am far from the world's leading expert on security. I want to give you three tools to enhance your security at three specific points in this pipeline, right? And the beauty of what I'm going to talk about today is it doesn't really matter that we're talking at a Java conference because basically all of them apply whether your runtime is Node, Python, PHP, or Java because we're talking about things that are a little more fundamental than the language itself. Um, mostly Unix and open source, just facts of life. Um, that being said, I have tried to customize it a little bit. Okay, so security topics is this huge, huge is, is the thing. You gotta start with some kind of a threat model. You can't just throw things at a wall and assume yourself is secure. By, by uh, com, you know, on the other side of the coin, you can't just make a great threat model and then check a bunch of boxes and assume that everything is good. Security is, is active work. It's going to the gym every day. Um, the more people you can bring into your pipeline, the better. When we, one of the reasons that we show this, um, that I've chosen to show this particular section as a line and not as a secondary loop is because the most common thing to say these days is to shift security left, which is a bit of a groaner, I'll give you that. But the idea basically that if um, there's a whole class of things, many of what we're gonna talk about today, that is a pain in the butt to do to your application once it's been deployed and you're in the monitoring phase. But if you catch that to do, if you catch that to do earlier in the phase, it's almost effortless to deal with. So if you can shift that stuff left, you can, you can make security's life easier. This is really just another iteration of what we've done with DevOps anyways, where there used to be a, a very large hole right here, maybe, maybe around build and it was just throw the jars over the wall and production would run them. Ask me how I know I was, I was production. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff you have to think about in security, secrets management, uh, what's going on with the network, your dependencies in open source, um, static and dynamic code scanning, um, fuzzing of your APIs, your applications, especially if you wrote any like gnarly network code and stuff like that. There's a whole concept of how you enforce it, what do you do with security rules, what do you do with any of the like 14 layers of platform that we're dealing with on a daily basis? There's a lot of questions there. And I'm only gonna answer a couple of them. And I'm really what I'm gonna try to do is give you sort of actional tool belt items that you can go back to, the, to work and be like, all right, we're gonna be better than we were yesterday. We're not gonna fix it all in one day. So um, this is hands-on, it's really hands-on for me, but just to give you a very simple set of what we're gonna go, um, we're gonna lint some Docker files, we're gonna audit some open source dependencies, we're gonna SSH into a Linux VM, we're gonna play with eBPF, and then we're gonna observe the cluster at a very um, very low level using Falco. Um, so let's dive into this building of the application phase. So the top, this is a quote, this is like, this is data, the top 10 Docker images each contain at least 30 vulnerabilities. When we say top 10, we know Ubuntu, Alpine, probably that open JDK image that, that we used a second ago, right? How is that possible? Well, the reason that's possible is because of the changing nature of open source, right? Where we're consuming open source and we're not just consuming big pieces of open source a lot, we're consuming little pieces of open source a lot. This is a screenshot from uh, this Medium post that I've linked down here, and this is a JavaScript uh, dependency chain, but it of course applies to every major language at this point. When you pull down a specific piece of code, you're actually pulling down all of its dependencies and then transitive dependencies and then transitive dependencies. And those can be very small pieces of code, they can be big pieces of code, but the reality is that's a huge surface area. So how do you keep track of making sure all of that is updated? Because um, honestly, like back in the day, the answer was like Red Hat or your Linux distributor would keep a list of all the things they supported and let you know whenever it was time to upgrade. But that's not true anymore, right? Now we're going to NPM. We're going to whatever the Java equivalent of NPM is. We're going to RubyGems. We're pulling down all the software, which all releases on its own cycle, breaking changes, CVEs, CVE responses are varied. There's a lot of challenges there. And so I don't work for this company. They don't pay me or whatever. Sneak uh, stands for so now you know. And this is a, a company. I should, I'm going to be clear about that. It's not an open source project. Of course, they're very aligned with open source. But the idea is that it slurps in your, in your case, probably the pom.xml and scans everything you've listed and then everything depending on your listed against this giant database that they've assembled of all the CVEs with some remediation and so on and give you a report that's like, hey, 
These are the, the low, medium, and high security vulnerabilities that you're exposed to before you write a single line of code. Um, is that always useful? No, because what it can turn into with any of these security tools is value by creating lots of noisy tickets, right? Which is not value. But the idea that you can identify, oh geez, we really gotta upload this specific library or whatever, or to the point of so now you know, you and the other people in charge can basically sit down and say, all right, this is the vulnerability. This is the likelihood that it's actually going to get, you know, we're actually affected by it based on how commonly deployed that particular library is, where it is in the infrastructure, what information it's sitting in front of. And this is the, the cost to us in terms of humans and money and stuff that either, that upgrading it is going to do. And again, this is one of those things that where you shift it left, it's early in the deployment pipeline, early in development, if developers are already rewriting that subsystem, they might as well upgrade some stupid library. Um, again, so this is, we're gonna do like a 30 second demo of SNCC once we get onto the command line, but this is an example of kind of what it dumps out, where it classifies them into like high severity, it tells you the specific type of, of issue it's going on, and some other you know, basic information around how it's accessed, how frequently it's being used in the wild, that kind of stuff. Um, I think the like sort of paid version of this will like generate pull requests to automatically update your pom.xml, which is again one of those things that's like low effort. Um, I always get a little tweaked out when I've got uh, robots trying to update my dependencies because it's like, hey, they don't know which breaking changes have been included or not. But um, it's the kind of thing. And I think that the reason it's valuable to work with a company on this specific issue is that the value that they provide is essentially the value that like Red Hat and Ubuntu and Debian used to provide, which is building the entire state in their brains or their database of what's connected to what and keeping track of the CVEs against all of it, right? Like pay somebody to do that. Don't build that at home and don't trust some giant GitHub repo to do it because that will eventually grow holes in it. So that's, that's, the, that's the building application way that we can add a little bit of security to it. Um, Skipping right over the testing the application and into the building of the image, I want to talk about how we build Docker images, how we go from working code to, to an immutable container that we can move around, the benefits there, so on. So, containerization really has complicated the picture, and this, this applies actually kind of throughout the talk, but developers can, in seconds, spread, uh, you know, bring in some ML workload with these Docker images that are based on Python base images that are based on a different Linux distribution than has ever been in the environment before. And that's a good thing, right? It's all about developer velocity at the end of the day. The tighter that loop is around development, idea to feature, idea to feature user feedback, that's how your company makes money, no joke. But from, a, from an operations perspective, it's like, oh geez, what is, what is reality? What is the status? I have a line in here that there's no steady state from which to reason anymore. You know, back when I was looking at JMX logs every day, there was one Red Hat VM image that everything was cloned from, and we knew a whole lot of things about it, and any changes would be applied globally. Now, all those assumptions are out the window, and as, as somebody who's trying to get a handle on making sure everything is consistent so that I can reason about it, I'm in a, I'm in a bad place. The other thing is that there's a component, and it's not exactly serverless, Serverless isn't the pause reason, the only reason for this, but you know, back in the day, you used to be able to look at an infrastructure and say, well, we're running three copies of this and three copies of this and 12 copies of this in a database. And now you have these dynamic workloads where responding to how the users are doing it and what has been deployed lately, you'll have some pods, some containers running, and then you check the next day, they're not running right now for whatever reason, and then they'll turn back on based on the dynamic nature of the load. Um, and that makes any kind of Reasoning about the steady state, what is true, what is, how often am I doing this, is very important, or very difficult to reason about. Um, and of course, all of this is underlined by the idea that open source has given us the ability to pull in all this really great software, and that's a good thing. Please don't walk away from this talk thinking, I don't love that we can consume more open source software than ever before, that's a great thing. But it comes with some risk. Um, so there's a utility I want to turn you on to called Hadolint. I, I think I'm saying that right. Um, I guess it's Hado Lint because it's Haskell Docker Fire Linter. I do not know that much about Haskell, aside to say that Haskell is sort of an esoteric programming language. Um, it's functional, it's difficult to write web servers in it, um, 
but people get it done. Uh, and it's actually been used as a linter before. There's a, there's a very popular linter called Shell Check, which is also written in Haskell, which is pretty cool. And this is one of those things that's like super easy if you shift it left, right? If you have a bunch of Docker images that are already out there deployed, and someone in your organization is like, I'm gonna get them all unified, like, oof, good luck, buddy. But if you just kind of say like, hey, all devs, we're gonna add this Hato lint to the kind of the pipeline so that, the early in the pipeline, so that you're just kind of iterating. When you pull down a Docker image, we're gonna run Hato lint on it first and then, then move on. They're like, okay, well, whatever. Now that it's in my critical path and I'm not under a ton of pressure and I don't have to change anything that's actually running, I can add that no problem. Um, what is Docker file linting useful for? Well, there's a bunch of little things that can sneak into a Docker file without really thinking about it that can cause issues. Um, this is, I don't have a good in my, my template, like a way to show terminals. We usually just go to the terminal, but I, I didn't want to lose speed on this. So the classic example is just like specifying the exact version of the app, of the application, of the, the library you want so that you know, and you can actually use other tools like SNCC and stuff to determine what you're using. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff, if you look at line 33 right here, uh, there's a whole bunch of ways that bash is bad. Um, it's just an unfortunate truth, and what they're talking about there is something called pipe fail, which is just one of dozens of ways that bash can like silently sort of trip you up and do a thing you didn't expect, and that can have all these cascading consequences. Um, another component that you can use Hato lint for is enforcing policy around not running your Docker images as root, but instead running them as individual users, which has, which is its own entire talk of why that's like valuable. Um, the point is like not running as root is generally a good idea. I don't know why everyone forgot that for like three years. Um, the last thing to point out here, and we will do a, a quick demo, is this invocation. And if you haven't seen that before, that's a little bit of a pattern that's called um, sort of the the utility Docker image or the, or the Commandlet Docker image. Basically, Hato lint is written in Haskell, and it's not like Go where it's going to be statically compiled. So you have to bring all these Haskell libs onto your environment to run it, which like ain't nobody got time for, right? So what we do is we just run the image in Docker and pass in the Docker file that we're testing, and then all the uh, the, the examinations actually run in there and come out the other side. The only consequence is this dev standard in for like what file was being modified on the output. But if you're wrapping this up in a CI system or just some larger test suite, nobody cares. It's like pretty easy to work with. Um, giant, uh, giant list of uh, user, um, these, you know, as with any linter, you know, there's a handful of things that all linters will have. The ability to deny a certain rule, uh, turn off rules for your local environment, add rules that your local environment has had, and then a giant repository of best practices in the upstream tool that is just a giant bike shed, right? But you know, you can get a sense there of things that are useful and, and simple ways to make your Docker images not just more secure, but also more consistent. And when your Docker images are more consistent, what you do is you empower your developers to move laterally throughout your entire infrastructure and make changes where they need to make changes without relearning how this team does X, Y, Z. Um, okay, so we've talked about building the app, we've talked about building the image, Let's talk about this monitor phase. Now, how many people feel like they are involved on some level of sort of monitoring and maintaining and watching their code in production? Okay, keep your hand up if, you, if you're on call. One or two people, yeah. So, so it sounds like most of you actually kept your hands down for the first question even. So it sounds like most of you are kind of still in that phase where you, you sort of cut the development, you do what the project manager says, and then you hand it to production, and if there's issues, they tell you about it, but you're not actively reading logs and stuff like that. Is that accurate? Okay. Well, ideally, we're gonna, it, the funny thing about DevOps is you take it to its natural length and everyone's doing every job and no one's getting any work done, so good job to like maintaining some ability to get work done. But um, you learn so much from seeing how it's actually deployed, from dealing with like the random failures that it runs into, you know, just simple stuff like, oh, well, sometimes Postgres takes a few more minutes to start. Let's add some retries. So containers make everything harder because everything is more numerous and ephemeral. We sort of talked about this before, but when you have the ability to spin up containers so, so easily, what you've done is you've moved the constraint from it was difficult to get infrastructure, which is where we were before, to I don't know what the heck is going on anymore, which is where we're at now. 
And so a new kind of speed and diversity of, of all these different things that are going on in your production environment requires like newer and better tools. So that's where Falco comes in. And nominally this talk is only about Falco, but I wanted to take the time to really, really level set where we are, where the software delivery pipeline and Falco interact, and give you some tools that aren't just Falco, because the reality is those other two tools you can go use in 30 minutes tonight, but Falco is like a bit more of a lift. Uh, it has to be installed as root on all the infrastructure, and then you need to set up a pipeline on the other end to deal with it. So it, it, there's some challenges. So Falco is a runtime security tool. Um, it's, it's an open source tool. It's in the CNCF incubating phase, which is in the middle between like where Kubernetes is and like what you might call the hinterlands of the sandbox CNCF. Um, it's driven by a, a company called Sysdig, which is a, a well-funded venture-backed startup but it has quite a few contributors from outside the company, including myself. Um, the core of how it works is it goes into the kernel, either through a kernel module or an eBPF probe, and watches all of the system calls going through the kernel, takes a read-only copy of those, and sends them to a user space daemon for analysis. Um, once they're in the, the user space daemon, there's an expressive rule set that we can use to, to filter those out and say this is standard operating procedure for this container, for this computer, whatever. This, this is scary, I need to do something with it. And has a pretty flexible at this point um, setup where you can configure what it does when the rules do identify a system call or an event as being potentially problematic. Um, it's worth noting at the very beginning that it's a tool that is good for reading state and does not do any enforcement. So a tool like SE Linux, SecComp, AMP Armor, those things are gonna actually lock down and prevent people from doing things on your system. Falco is just about knowing what's going on with your system. And the analogy that most people use is for home security. And so for home security, you usually have two things. You have a deadbolt, yes, but then you also have like an ADT or some kind of alarm system that will indicate that a, door, a window was opened, whether you've locked the window or not. And, and Falco is very much on that alarm system side, not on the enforcement side. Although there are some pipelines we can build to do enforcement. Finally, there's a Slack for uh, Falco, which is pretty active. So this is the overall architecture. Um, the kernel module or the eBPF probe read every system call, as I said and they forward that to the user space daemon, which is Falco. We also can consume data from the K, uh, Kubernetes audit log, which has all kinds of useful information, like so-and-so authorized by this um, token ran this command, whether that's kill pod or create namespace or whatever it is, and that gives you a sense of whether or not um, that's all in compliance as well. Then into Falco, we also feed all the rules and config, and we'll, we'll dive into the rules in some depth here in a little bit. Then there's the filtering, which I didn't really know how to describe, so I wrote a box. And then you have all these outputs. And there's a lot of different outputs that you can do. There's even a meta output tool called Falco Sidekick, but the standard ones are all there, right? Um, dump to standard out, run a command, or pull using gRPC and push that into something else. Or you can write a gRPC client that can watch all the events and, and, um, and take action on that. Um, so eBPF, I talked about that. How many people have heard of eBPF? A couple hands. How many people have heard of BPF? BPF is the Berkeley Packet Filter. It basically goes back to like 1992. This is like TCP Unix sockets, right? eBPF is the extended version of that. It's in the Linux kernel. This is something to go check out because there's going to be so much dope software written in the next 10 years because this eBPF stuff all came out. Um, my usual analysis analogy with eBPF is, have you seen this meme? Uh, how to draw an owl? Draw some circles. Draw the rest of the owl. <laughs> That's basically how eBPF works. You say like, oh yeah, it's 1992. It's the same thing as the TCP sockets. Extended BPF. And then draw the rest of the flame graph. Which usually, you know, it's like, oh, okay, I can make those. I don't, I don't know how that works. I don't, but okay, yeah, that seems cool. Uh, yeah, yeah, tell me more about my computer. Um, it's kind of hard to get started. It's absolutely like a very low level thing. And it's especially frustrating because it's not one of those low level things that stays low level. It's like, oh man, people that are my peers are getting really cool insights out of their applications because of this technology that's very low level. Um, but there's two cool, two cool books to write. Brendan Gregg is sort of the, the godfather of all this. He invented this flame graph concept. Um, or I don't know about the concept, but certainly this is a flame graph from his website. 
and he was the first one that popularized them some years ago at this point. And then Lorenzo and David, uh, Lorenzo is actually a contributor to um, Falco itself, uh, talking about how you can go in there with eBPF and get all this insight about your computer. So I definitely recommend you read that. Um, the high level notes from somebody who's not really an expert is that you write these eBPF programs, they're called probes, and one of the things that's really exciting about them is that they read only access to the kernel and they're sort of isolated from other things. You know, if you have a, in most organizations, if you go to the DevOps team or the system, the Unix team or whatever the team is called and you say, hey, we have this Linux kernel module we need to put in all our machines, they are going to laugh at you and laugh at you and say, no, we are never gonna do that. The only, the only um, kernel modules we're gonna add come directly from Red Hat and that's it. Just, that's the end of the conversation, right? Because a kernel module is extremely scary and there's not just like, do I trust this? It's like, if, it, if I trust the individual that wrote it but they wrote it wrong, your kernel will completely deadlock, you can have total chaos in the, in the land, right? BPF, eBPF sort of uh, short circuits that by providing a read-only safe sandbox way to get insights out of the kernel without giving the keys away to the kingdom. Um, they're written in a special assembly language. The Java people might enjoy that there's a JIT involved. Um, and then like more importantly for us, there's a handful of tools that give us some like basic hooks for mere mortals to use to get some insights about the system that we never had before. And I am really just quite limiting my discussion here to Linux systems because that's what I know and that's what I can realistically talk about. So this is, this is a Unix system. It's a Unix system, JurassicPark.gif. Uh, some 4.15 kernel, so I guess it's kind of old at this point. Um, but there's these tools called Killsnoop BPFCC, and what this is gonna do is it's gonna use eBPF to watch for all the kill signals coming through the system. Um, so what I'll do is I'll make two more terminals, and if this is too small, let me know, just shout it out. So I'm running htop over here, uh, and when I run kill on the, on the htop, you'll be able to see that come through instantly, right? And it, can you imagine how hard it would be to actually trap that event if you didn't have like the tool that was just up there? Like there's no, there's, I don't know how to do that. What are you gonna do, like tail things or watch things? Like the ability to just go in there and grab stuff out and ask what's going on in the system, set up a probe and watch it. It's like Solaris again, it's like D-Trace. This is really exciting. Um, point of order. Somebody should say, Spencer, why is SSHD getting this nine kill with this, this signal nine? This, why is, well, well, there's another one, what's the deal? Does anyone know what the deal is? Any guesses? It's, someone in this room. it's not someone in this room, well it might be, but. No, but this is a, just a random server on the internet and what that means is you have randos just trying to SSH in with like passwords like herp derp, and once they fail enough passwords, it, there's actually a kill signal in there to actually destroy the, destroy the child of SSHD. Again, something that we would just never know if we didn't know to look for it or have something like eBPF there to give us some signals about what's going on in the system. So, there's like a very basic example of the kind of information we can get out of our Unix system. Let's take it up to 11 with like the software we really wish was written because I can show Tmux all day but that's not, it's not operationalized or productionized, right? Um, all right, once again, we're gonna lint some Docker files, we're gonna audit some open source dependencies, we're gonna observe the cluster, we're gonna observe the host. We just observed the host, so we're in good shape on that. Um, oh my gosh, we're kinda running out of time. All right, so the first thing to do is orient myself in my Tmux. All right. In this case, I have three Docker files. The first one is maybe the most interesting. This is, uh, this is part of our machine learning code we have over at IBM. Um, uh, there's a bunch of, and that, that's a great example, right? Because your machine learning folks are mostly interested in getting TensorFlow to work, and they're like, I, don't know, I got Docker to work, man. I'm not that worried about it. And the thing to like maybe point out is like stuff like this, line 25, where 
Doc, I'll just say it, Docker files are not like the best experience that anyone's ever had, right? And what they encourage is junk like this, where you're writing this like super long, confusing, variable interpolated shell liner. Like I already talked about how Bash itself is not that trustworthy, and Docker encourages us to put them all on unreadable one-liners, right? This, this is a code smell. We can do better than this. But what we can do is we can run Hadolint. So there is that, again, that sort of command Docker image um, form. It, as you can see, that once you've pulled down the Docker image, it's actually quite fast. And it gives me out just a couple cute little, um, little command line, little tips on how to do it, how to do better. Uh, there's Docker file. I, uh, ooh. We can run it on this um, Java 8 from Oracle version. We get other things. Again, this is the pipe fail situation, which I definitely recommend you check out. And then some advice on how to use apt correctly. There's also advice on how to use Alpine correctly or APK, which is the, the, the package manager over there. And then finally, there's Docker file. And the Docker file Java that we're running right now is actually the one that we were, we showed the three line Docker file that we showed before. And so you can see the happy path as well. That if there's no errors, it just echoes out like a lint or should and, and, and basically doesn't do anything too crazy. So there's, there's that. Um, SNCC has this pretty cool dashboard that we can talk about. How many people have heard of the web goat? Hands up. So there's an organization called OWSAP, which is um, an acronym for something, but they're a, a well-known security group. They, they, sh they publish that top 10 list of the top 10 security vulnerabilities that web applications every year, which is actually interesting because it's pretty much the same static things, you know, SQL injection and so on. Um, but what they publish as well is a system of scapegoat applications uh, that are intentionally written to be bad, such that uh, security researchers and people who need an example of an a, a badly written application have something to, to jump off of. The web goat is, I think, the Java 8 version of the, um, the Java application that has been the GOAT for like, I think years and years and years. And you can import it pretty easily into SNCC, which I've actually already done. And so we can dive directly into the web GOAT server pom.xml here. And we get this, this nice list of items, you know, deserialization of untrusted data. Everybody understands that that's the kind of thing that gets you into trouble. They try to be as very specific as possible about where it's happening in your code, how you can fix it, what the challenges of that are gonna be. It's just, it's just the basics. Now, as I said, this can turn into, um, you know, that unread email folder with thousands of notifications that no one's doing anything about, right? And if that's what you're gonna do with this, organ with this kind of information, like maybe don't mess with it. But if you have the opportunity to slow down a little bit, which is hard with all the managers and stuff, um, you know, there's sort of a, the way that these things actually get added to infrastructure is it's, it really hurts the first couple and then you're into a steady state and it's just helping you. And it keeps your code more mature anyways. And it's a way to maybe, you know, if you really want to meta think about it, one of the things you can do with this giant list of scary looking vulnerabilities is we know it's kind of just noise in the requirements file, but the managers might not. And if you show them this, oh my God, scary, high vulnerability, oh shit. You know, sometimes you might get some engineering cycles to go work on something that matters, which would be kind of cool. Um, so that's SNCC, it's pretty cool. Um, we can just for fun import one project just to show you that it's not, it's not complicated, nor is it scary. Um, and then it should import really quickly. Fresh, hello Spencer, palm.xml, and it's only found, you know, I guess I could have cross site scripting and denial of service on my hello world application, so that's cool. All right, now let's dive into the thing we all actually came here for, which is Falco, woo, drum roll please. So Falco, let's unbreak it. Falco is deployed, uh, there's a couple different ways in Kubernetes, but Helm is what we're gonna do today. Helm is the package manager for Kubernetes. Um, it doesn't really matter for the purpose of what we're doing. It's just a means to an end, kind of like kubectl. Now that we've installed 
Uh, all Helm has done is told Kubernetes to please run the daemon. Now we're running the daemon. And we can check, we can verify that with kubectl get pod. We can see that we have these three Falco runs. Why are there three? Because we have three nodes in our cluster. Those, those pods actually run at extremely high privilege because they're the auditor of the whole system. And it's used as something called a Kubernetes daemon set to make sure that we have one pod per physical node. And then if you read the logs, it's actually super spicy. Uh, what this pod does when it first starts up, what the container does, it's bind mounted in on proc and all these other like privileged container cons uh, things. It's a privileged container and it has bind mounts into scary uh, directories on the host. What it actually will do is it'll go ahead and use DKMS to build the Falco kernel module and shove it into the kernel, which is actually like hacker for sure. Um, but then what it does is it pulls in its Falco rules and then launches and now it's running. And by default, it's just gonna write to standard out, which is all we really need for it to do today. Um, to prove that it's working to you, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have this like this split, and I'm actually gonna split the other way. Get pod kubectl logs dash f, which means we're gonna follow the logs of this thing. And then up here, when you're uh, attacking an application or you're attacking somebody's infrastructure, what is the like, I've done it, I've made it, hacker voice I'm in, it's popping a shell. It's when you can convince the application to execute a program on the Unix host, and usually what you want to launch is something like bin bash, because at that point you can do all the horizontal um, shenanigans you want to do. So what we'll do is we'll simulate that I've hacked the application with this command, which is just telling Kubernetes to please launch a shell. And then it's supposed to <laughs> supposed to down here tell me that I uh, that I launched a shell. Uh, I didn't even deploy the webgoat actually. So it, all from the Falco. Why do they run on the? Why does the Falco pod run on the node? The Falco pod runs on the node because once it's it's plugged into the kernel on the node, it doesn't matter which container uh, any badness happens. It can see it all, and in fact. The only hard part to write is the funny thing is to ask Kubernetes, all right, you, you know, Falco says, hey, or BPF and Falco say, like, hey, I got this kind of concerning error. This is the namespace that it was launched in. Can you please tell me what your name for that namespace is? And it's like, oh, we refer to that namespace as this container in this namespace, yada, yada, yada. Um, so that's kind of annoying that it didn't uh, work. Um, maybe we'll try one of these other. What it's supposed to do is, is output a, a message right there that says like, hey, I saw a shell was launched. Um, maybe, maybe, um, maybe if I try it on this side. There can be some, some bugs where right after it's, it's launched, it, it has some, some slowness to it, but that's okay. Um, or I've, I've messed up my inputs and outputs is also a possibility you could cut a good CM. Hmm. Anyway, doesn't matter. So what I want to show next is um, we t is the the rules and the syntax of this. So how do you define these rules that the Falco is going to process all the system calls with, and then how do you extend those rules? What are the rules? Well, let's go back to our Helm chart because we start with, oops. Huh? So we have this Helm chart and in the Helm chart there are, there's a rules directory and the rules directory is just gonna be thrown into Etsy Falco on all of the Falco pods. And then inside there what we have are the rules. And much like the Hato lint list of um, Docker code smells, Docker linting, Docker file linting rules, this is one of these things that's collaboratively built by the open source community and it has gotten quite large. So it's a 2600 line file just completely full of YAML. Um, and one of the reasons it's full of YAML is that what you, 
get with Falco is the fire hose of every operation that's happening on the system. So that's every socket that's get opened, every program that gets run, every file that gets opened for writing, every file that gets opened for reading, and so on and so forth. And what you can do with Falco is say like, oh, a bash shell was executed. In any context, that's a scary thing. Or a file below Etsy was written. Somebody tried to write to Etsy shadow. That's a bad thing, I'm gonna report it. But there's also a lot of general noise on the system of a healthy functioning system that is expected, right? If apt is the program that's modifying uh, var lib apt resources.list or the, the cache files in there, you know, that's okay. Like, we understand that. And so what this, six, you know, this 2600 line file is doing is actually whitelisting quote unquote good behavior. But what I want to talk about today is the, the rule system. I, I think it's also worth noting if you've ever played with Ansible or anything that, um, the base concept in this language is the rule, and then it leverages macros and lists and things, so you get one of these languages in, in YAML. But starting just right off the beginning, right below root, an attempt to write to any file directly below slash or root, um, root dir and event dir and open write is sort of the base rule, which makes sense. You know, it's human readable. Maybe you don't in intuitively know how to write these, but you can certainly read them kind of to begin with. And then it's just like a ton of stuff that's the exceptions to that, right? Maven writing Groovy, RPM writing root RPM DB, Airflow, which is like a, a Google thing, I think, Rancher, Calico, and so all the authors and interested parties of all these other open source projects have come in and sort of whitelisted their, what their application does so that it doesn't generate dumb noise in your log files that, that nobody actually cares about. So that's how that works. Um, I want to talk also about, did this decide it's going to, oh, sorry. Ah. Is it, does it decide it's going to work now? Well, geez, team, I don't know. It's supposed to work. <laughs> I probably did something in, in the hurry, but generally speaking, when you, when you violate any of those rules, you get a nice little standard out message explaining um, what the challenge is with that. Uh, the other thing to talk about is the config file for Falco and what the output um, specifiers are and can be. Does that make sense? So if we, since clearly that's not getting anywhere, um, let me close that. And I think, oh gosh, uh, less, cat. Um, what you can see really quickly is any daemon would have some standard configurations, but there's some things. Do you want to log in JSON or do you want to log sort of like in a syslog format of just text? is one of the first questions you have to answer. Then you want to decide um, whether you want to run a web server, whether you want to run a gRPC server, whether you want to use HTTP output, or as you can see down there in the middle, there's a nice standard system for just executing a command. So if you want to throw every Falco alert, every Falco alert's gonna basically call that command with, with um, some variable, you have some variables that are available on that line. Um, and so you can run mail.s, you can run curl, you can just vomit these into to different um, projects, you can do all that kind of stuff. And then finally, what I wanna talk about, because I'm almost done, is this project called Falco Sidekick, which is sort of the meta tool you can use to send these alerts wherever they need to go. Um, the, Falco side, the Falco program will run into the Falco Sidekick, and then Falco has configured outputs for InfluxDB, for NATS, for AWS Lambda, for C, uh, simple queuing service, for Datadog, wherever it needs to go, you can probably get it there with Falco Sidekick, and if you have something that's unique and not on the list, you know, it's like 25 lines of Golang to add it to the Falco Sidekick. Once again, this is the Falco architecture. Uh, we read the, the sys syslog events, we send them into Falco, we process the configs, and we have our outputs. So anyways, 
Uh, my name is Spencer Crom. There's a bunch of people I'd like to say thank you to, and are there any questions? All right, well, thank you. Yes, thank you.